Hi everyone, my name is Mihir Bagot and today I'll be presenting on how spinal muscular atrophy impacts muscular contractions. So the musculoskeletal and the nervous system are two of the 11 important organ systems in the human body. They both work together to help the body move while also keeping the organs functioning. These two systems work hand in hand with the nervous system relaying information for the muscular system to react and respond to stimuli. So now I want to talk about how muscular contractions contribute to homeostasis. So skeletal muscles contribute to homeostasis by mainly producing heat as a byproduct of metabolism from muscular contractions. The muscular contractions and relaxations also contribute to homeostasis by controlling body passages and openings for the movement of substances and materials throughout the body while also playing a role in glycemic control. So the muscle and nerve cells are considered electrically excitable cells because their plasma membranes show voltage changes when stimulated and the electrical activity of the cells is based on the difference in concentration of ions in the intracellular fluid with those two main ions being sodium and potassium. So in the excitation process, the first step is the action potential, which is in the nerve fiber, it leads to the action potential in the muscle fiber. So in, the, in this image, we see the nerve impulse traveling down the motor neuron into the axon terminal, which then triggers the opening of the voltage-gated ion channels. So the second step is when the opening of the voltage-gated channels triggers the synaptic vesicles to release a neurotransmitter called ACE tycholine. So this results in an end plate potential. So as the ACE tycholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft, as seen in this image, it binds the receptor sites in the sarcolemma and produces that end plate potential. So the next step is forming that action potential. So following the end plate potential, the result of the net movement of potassium and sodium ions leads to the creation of an action potential. So now it's about distributing that action potential. So the wave of excitation created from the action potential spreads in all directions throughout the muscle. The action potentials are then propagated down the T-tubules as seen in this image. The next step is the release of calcium. So the action potential opens the voltage-gated ion channels in the T-tubules and triggers the release of calcium from the terminal cistern into the systole. So now, the structure of a muscle is made up of long protein cores called myofibrils, which in itself are a bundle of parallel protein microfilaments called myofilaments. Those myofilaments are made up of three different kinds, thick, thin, and elastic. So now, the next process is the excitation and contraction coupling. So once the calcium is released from the terminal cistern, it binds to the troponin of the thin filaments, and this results in the troponin tropomyosin complex, which exposes the active sites for binding with the myosin heads. So now the next step is converting ATP. So the myosin head needs an ATP molecule bound to it in order to start the contraction. Thus, the enzyme myosin ATPase hydrolyzes the ATP into ADP and phosphate P. The energy which is released cocks the head of the my myosin into a high energy position to perform the next movement. So now this forms a cross bridge. So the cocked myosin head then binds to the active sites in the thin filament, forming a cross bridge between the myosin and actin. The next step is the power stroke. So the myosin releases ADP and P and flexes into a low energy position, which is bent and is tugged to the thin filaments, which creates the power stroke and completes the contraction. 
So during the contraction, actual contraction process, the myosin hit binds the new ATP, which destabilizes the previously established myosin and actin bond, and consequently breaks the cross bridge. The myosin hit then prepares for the recovery stroke to finish the cycle. So now the next process is the relaxation of the muscle. So with initiating the recovery, after achieving the recovery stroke, the neuromuscular junction stops receiving nerve signals and results in a ceased acetylcholine release. The acetylcholine separates from the receptor and is broken down into fragments by the enzyme ACHNE. The axon terminal then reabsorbs the fragments and ceases the ACH stimulation. The next step is reabsorbing the ions. So simultaneously throughout the contraction period, the sarcoplasmic reticulum reabsorbs the calcium ions and when the nerve signal stops firing, the calcium, which is released from the reticulum, stops. Then the level of free calcium in the systole drops significantly and dissociates from the troponin. This results in it returning to the original position. So the tropomyosin returns to its original position by blocking the active sites and preventing the myosin and actin bond. This produces tension in the muscle fibers and completes the contraction and relaxation cycle. So now I wanna talk about spinal muscular atrophy. So spinal muscular atrophy is a genetically inherited disease which attacks the motor neurons in the spinal cord. As the individuals age, the motor neurons, which control the muscular movements, die and cause the muscles to weaken, affecting one's ability to walk breathe, and even eat. So, the nervous system is the superhighway of the body. It relays information and monitors the body's processes through electrical impulses, through neurons, from two of its different subsystems called the central and peripheral nervous system. So the nervous system and the muscular system as I mentioned earlier, work together to control the movement of skeletal muscles as well as the opening and closing of body passages. Spinal muscular atrophy genetically inhibits the communication between motor neurons and the muscular tissues, and this prevents the body from responding to stimuli and thus losing control of voluntary muscles. This is why the disease is so important because it prevents the essential conversion of ATP and that is pretty much the most essential important of muscular contraction.